Thank you all very much for coming on such a wet and horrible night. If I make it worthwhile for you. The subject tonight is what on earth is space weather? About 15 years ago, um, a new scientific discipline started to emerge called scientific weather. And you can see it on the screen. Space weather is something that we can see and measure. It's very simple. 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 It's very there are many ways that uh, uh, space weather touches our lives. If you aren't, then you're in for, the next, for another boring hour. So, <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, uh, let's get on with it. Uh, the sun, of course, drives the whole solar system. It emits energy in many different forms. Uh, and that, that energy uh, that basically determines the ambient conditions for our solar system. Sort of rather like space time. But the Earth, the influence of the sun stretches well beyond the Earth, about well beyond all the planets, for about 100 AU. And so, effectively, the Earth is orbiting in the Earth's in the sun's atmosphere. And so, if that changes, it will affect us in some way. The question is, how much does it have to change before we notice the, the difference? In what way will we notice those differences? And, um, and we have never realized the sun is a variable star. Now, some years ago, I was uh, reading a bunch of VIPs from another company uh, trying to sell them the technology. They always um, trundled out their team to find this out to me uh, to say, not only do we do uh, technology, but we do science as well. And so I, that was my job, and I was talking about the sun, and I said, the sun is a very star. Now, one of the VIPs, I think the next admiral, sort of woke up at that point and said, um, uh, the sun is a variable star? I didn't know that. Uh, but this was said in a sort of voice of wonder and enthusiasm that I normally like to have my audience react to that particular statement. It was more in terms of, it's your fault that I didn't get the memo of the Galileo. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so I didn't really know what quite to do about that. Now, when I made this question, the group sort of went to a sun silence. Okay. Uh, and I, I, so I was sort of really stupid to break that. Um, and normally when you get that sort of reaction, you know you said something stupid. The best thing to do is either shut up and hope somebody else will pick up and say something more stupid that people will remember. <laughs> or you change the subject to something you know about, which says why you're at that meeting and it's important to be at that meeting. But this guy didn't. He doesn't stand on it. He said, we should do something about that. <laughs> Now, the variability occurs on a wide range of time scales from less than a second to billions of years. So let's actually take a look at what forms some of those variations take. Uh, very, very short time scales, we have gamma ray and hard X ray bursts. Those are a fraction of a second to a few seconds, sometimes a few minutes. A bit longer, we have impulsive flares. Those that occur in time scales of a few minutes to maybe up to an hour. Then we have what's called long duration events, which are long duration flares, which I've seen one last as long as 30 hours, uh, and those are often uh, associated with sort of mass ejections, which take several hours to reach the sun and several days to reach the Earth. Then we have solar rotation. So the sun rotates uh, at the average latitude of some spot is 27.27 days with respect to the Earth. Uh, and so if you do any analysis, a Fourier analysis, to find the um, time scale of solar variability, if you don't have a peak of 27.27 days, you probably have made a mistake. Um, because what happens is that the solar rotation over a period of a couple of days can take something from the back of the sun to the front of the sun, increasing activity, or take something from the front of the sun to the back of the sun and reduce uh, activity. And that, that activity uh, region will come back in two to two three weeks time. Some spots here in an hour or two and can disappear just as quickly. But equally, some spots can go right to several rotations for the last month. We have coronal holes. Those um, are can again appear relatively rapidly, especially associated with uh, from mass ejection. But a big coronal hole like the one that we have here, uh, a translatorial coronal hole, 
uh, can appear and return in many different locations. And interestingly enough, you can see it's about, about the same shape in each location. So it doesn't seem to suffer from differential rotation like one of other features. Uh, uh, then, uh, as I should say, the homochrome holes, you can see one there, the other one is the curious at the moment, uh, last for basically the whole of the solar cycle. So the cycle itself, the sunspot cycle, is 22 years, uh, 11 years. So then you have the magnetic cycle, which uh, is 22 years, quite long, for the polarity of the sunspot in the say, reverse it, 11 years. And there are hints of longer um, uh, variable variations, and the full for an 80 year period, a 500 year period, a 2000 year period. I take all those with a huge pinch of salt on the um, because I don't think there's enough evidence, I don't think the proxies are, are good enough to really be able to, to say the, to any, any uh, certainty. We also have the energy diffusion time. The moment energy takes energy from the center, the center of the sun, to the surface of the sun. We know this takes just over eight minutes for the light from the, from the most sphere to reach the Earth. This takes something between 20,000 and 2 million years for it to reach from the center of the sun to the surface that's because it keeps bouncing around inside and have great identity there in what's called a random walk process before it reaches it. So the center of the sun would go out, and it'd be two million years before we actually see the effect of the part of the genome. Uh, and then, of course, we have the revolution time scales, uh, which is billions of years. So, you know, the sun is going to be a red giant in about four million, three or four billion years' time, in which case it's going to be a very unhealthy place for us to be. The shorter time scales tend to be space weather, the longer time scales tend to be space climate, and there's a sort of grey area in between which nobody's really sure of what, what, what the next question is. But so basically, climate, the space climate, is what you expect, average of uh, the space weather. And space weather is what you get day to day. So that's what we're basically using. The, 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 the short term variation is the space weather. Now, let's take a look at some variability. Here we have the sun up, up, up in the top uh, right here, uh, now year by year, starting in 1996, now 1997. So we're beginning to come out of the solar minimum now. You can see that the, the next year, 98, we've got a few more activations, they're quite large. Now we're getting larger, more extensive, 99. 2000 was allegedly a uh, solar maximum. You need to have a massively, and they're interacting across the equator. 2001 and 2002 is still pretty active, so we're still up there in solar maximum position. Uh, but the reason we're maybe getting a bit smaller is a bit less connected. By 2003, uh, you've got a few isolated regions still quite active. 2004, fewer again. And in 2005, very few active regions, they're small and consistent. It's interesting to note here the size of the polar coronal hole is here, it's much larger now. And by solar maximum, basically the whole of the um, two hemispheres, apart from a very narrow band near the equator, uh, is around the hole. So, how does the, um, how does the uh, uh, variation of sun affect these planets? It depends on several things. The distance to the sun is important. If you're close to the sun, then the radiation is very important. The further out you get, Radiation becomes less important than what is the inverse square. Uh, it also strengthens the magnetic field of the planet. Magnetic field acts as a shield to particles. Um, so the stronger the magnetic field, the more those planets are protected from particles. Atmospheric density, dense atmosphere, also shields you from radiation to various sites and also particles. So um, in some cases, also helps preserve heat. We would be 30, 40 degrees centigrade cooler than we are now if it wasn't for the carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases in our atmosphere. Um, so let's compare the planets. Here's the, here's the, here's the planet, and this is the sun. Um, I wonder what that strange square was there, because that's the dome, isn't it? It's not a mistake in my PowerPoint. Okay, so let's compare the other two parameters, the magnetic field and the atmosphere of each planet. Let's call the Earth average. Compare this with that. So, Mercury, very weak magnetic field, no atmosphere. So it gets bombarded with all particles, all radiation, um, and it's preparing in such a place to live. Venus is almost the reverse. It has no magnetic field at all, or a negative magnetic field, but a very dense atmosphere. 
So the atmosphere is not shielding from those particles, but the atmosphere is so dense, it shields the surface from the particles and the radiation. Earth, average average. Mars, very weak and patchy. You see, we have a very patchy magnetic field and a very tenuous atmosphere. So if you're going to go to Mars, you're going to be subject to all these space weather effects in space. Um, so if we're going to set up a permanent base on bar, Mars, it better be with these, these new crowns, otherwise we're going to get the satisfied astronauts. Um, we move ahead a bit further to Jupiter, and that has got a very strong magnetic field, it's got the strongest magnetic field of any of the planets in the solar system, and that magnetic field stretches all the way sometimes to Saturn. Now, of course, the atmosphere is very dense in gas giant. Saturn has got about the same sort of magnetic field as the Earth, but again, very dense atmosphere. Um, Uranus has a similar uh, magnetic field to Earth, but it's not very well measured, and again, very dense atmosphere. But Uranus is very strange from one point of view. Does anybody know what it is? It's a very tilted, yes. Yeah. So the um, pole of um, Uranus, the two poles, at, for 42 years, point at the sun. And that makes the most vulnerable part of the planet open to all these uh, particles flowing in. Neptune um, is got a strong magnetic field, though, though again it's not very well measured, and a dense atmosphere. Uh, but it's now so far out that radiation is hardly playing any role in its dynamics at all. So all of these things are very different. But the one that we're concerned about is the Earth. So what are the harbingers of space weather for these short term effects that we're talking about? There are three of them. So the flares, the wrong map section, and I'll explain what the difference between those are in a minute. And so wind. He uses their own type of space weather, he uses their own type of space weather on different time scales. So let's take a look at the flares. The movie on the right here is of the Halloween flares in 2003. Um, a flare is a sudden release of magnetic energy. Magnetic fields become stretched and twisted and they store energy like a, like a rubber band would do if you did the same thing. And when a flare occurs, it's like having a rubber band, all that energy is released at one time. The primary emissions from the flare are thermal emissions uh, in terms of light, characterized by temperatures from 5,000 to 20 million degrees Kelvin. So, the primary emissions then are gamma rays, radio, and also accelerated particles. Now, if you've been watching this video, you'll notice when some of these flares go off, there's little um, uh, snow on the, on the images. You sort of see a little dot all over, little streaks on the images. Uh, those are the particles being accelerated in the flare. That, that big one will occur, occur there. Now, do you see there's a lot of little white specks that, that occur there? Another one will occur in Italy in very short, perhaps quite spectacular. Any second now? Any second now? There we go. See all those? Those are protons being accelerated in the flare and which are nearly relativistic velocity. So they arrive not in eight minutes from the uh, sun, but in 20 to 40 minutes from the sun. And they crash into the uh, um, focal plane of the instrument. So uh, somewhat ironically, the best time to see a flare is when the flare is occurring, but that's the worst time to see a flare because that's where all the background is more detected So it's rather annoying. Time scale here is, is several hours. Moving on. What way is it going to be That is uh, extreme ultraviolet, I suspect, I forget which one the green one is uh, for um, for Soho. Um, it, it looks like it's a sort of a temperature of around about one and a half to two million degrees, so I expect it's either iron fifteen or iron fourteen or something like that. I think here's the time for the protons. Uh, twenty minutes to four minutes, one to four. We don't need a long point. Now flares are characterized by their X ray intensity. Uh, this, is, this is measured by the Noah Gose instrument in the one way angstrom band. My apologies, I do not use it nanometers, I use angstrom. Um, <laughs> just a strange thing. Just divide by 10, whatever I say. Um, okay, so the lowest category of flare is an A flare, which corresponds to a uh, intensity of uh, 100 millionth of a watt per square meter, which doesn't actually sound like a great deal of uh, energy when it is. So we don't pay very much attention to A flares. The next category out the B flares. Those are 10 times larger. This is, this is a, a logarithmic scale, you can't see the scale on the, on the left here. Uh, they're, they're, so that's um, 110 million per watt, which isn't really important, so we don't pay much attention to those either. The next category up is C flare. Now these are beginning to get interesting, and, and this is flare here is uh, C9 flare in the show. So, what do you think the next category will be? We've got A flare, B flare, C flare, what will be 
some to call that cat. Uh, no? And I've not heard anybody know to explain what, why they call them this, but maybe it's an M player. Uh, M player again, 10 times larger, and these are important. In fact, one of the largest proton events uh, of the cycle so far was from a mere M8 player, not any of these, it's called X player that we've seen so far. The next player up, uh, given, it, given it away, the next player. I said I'm large again. These are all very important. We've had just 12 of them so far in the cycle, and they produce uh, fairly uh, strong um, takeaway effect. Now, I always argue that now uh, the next category up should be Y, and the last category uh, is Z. Uh, or sorry, C, uh, yes, I am talking about this. Um, uh, but they didn't, they, they uh, uh, a player with 10 times larger than the next one there is the next 10 there. So, um, um, they wouldn't act on that. But so, so this is what you'll hear. You'll hear it. It's in an X there, or it's in an N there, or there's several C there, or whatever. And that's why people get excited. Okay, so we've got, so I'm going to talk about it there, so now, now we'll know what the category is going to be set like. Um, so, what, the, what are the emissions that we've got to worry about from there? Well, gamma ray is the first thing. And the problem there, I don't think it's showing up real well, is my eye back. But gamma rays occur, this is a hard x ray burst to see here. You see the sharp burst and the large burst following. Um, gamma ray bursts occur in, during that first first there. So they are instantaneous. When you know that there is going on, you're already invaded by uh, gamma rays. So you can't, you can't warn for them in any particular way. And it's a very penetrating emission, it's a very uh, ionized emission. And so it's a, it's a problem for astronauts to call that sign when such a um, uh, event occurs. Then we have other problems. The X-ray, EUV, and UV are also ionizing radiation, very powerful. But those actually absorb things in our upper atmosphere and they cause problems with uh, heating the atmosphere, the upper atmosphere. And that uh, doesn't help the uh, uh, satellite, lower orbiting satellite. We've already seen the effects of protons uh, on. Um, on the focal plane of the instrument, and they would have a pretty much similar effect on the national. A friend of mine, uh, I actually had a, an opportunity to uh, buy and become um, a specialist on, on Space Lab 2. A friend of mine uh, came out uh, of that specific com uh, 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 competition, and he told me, of the was Lauren Acton, he told me that when you go up in space, one of the spookiest things uh, being a uh, um, so we're stronger, so you know what's going on. But when you try to go to sleep in full dark, um, when you close your eyes, mm -hmm. there are all these little sparkles in your eyes. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, uh, that is high energy particles coming in and ionizing the jelly in your eyeball. Mm -hmm. Now I'll leave you with that nice thought for a yeah. moment. No, I'm happy to What players don't do, so this is some like XP. I get from uh, uh, my YouTube channel. Players do not affect climate by heating the Earth directly. Uh, they do not affect weather by heating the Earth directly. You can see here, uh, I hope you can see here, we've got a outline of a, um, a, a, a X there here, um, superimposed upon this dark line, which is a, um, uh, the total solar rate of the sun. The total solar rate of the sun, the total amount of energy coming from the sun. Um, per square meter. So the measure of how much energy you're receiving. Now, if there, uh, and the, the, the exterior is that here, if, if you haven't come see the line, I can't see it, I'm just thinking that. But there is no particular change in the uh, amount of, um, of radiation seen uh, at that particular time. And this, this value is measured in part in several, mil uh, several million. So it's a very accurate measurement. We should show something. And what they did down the bottom here is they lined up the um, heat from 140 squares, I think it was, and then uh, added up the total solar radius at, uh, at those times to see whether they could beat down the noise and produce the heat. Now, as you can see, at zero here, there is sort of a hint of the heat about the tree signal level, which is scientifically significant. The problem I have with this is that most of the heating this shoulder here before the flare time. So before the flare, flare needs to be in a stack here. So I'm a little bit uh, suspicious about this particular 
lot of folks. So the effect is minimal, parts in millions. It's not enough to do to change our weather or to change our climate. Another thing I get a lot of is how flares and thermal mass ejections cause earthquakes and volcanic eruptions. Uh, and there's lots of examples. Oh, there's a fair amount of we had an earthquake. Now, the point is that there's so far the cycle we've had on average about three or four flares a day. And on average it's something like six to twenty um, uh, er uh, eruptions or, um, uh, or earthquakes a day. So some of them are bound to line up. Especially as the uh, people that propose this give themselves plus or minus four days on uh, a lot of the, uh, the events. So uh, I think there's I think it's in the proper statistical studies and there's no connection. What we do get is a lot of very interesting uh, uh, theory that people sort of say, oh, we had a big player, end is coming, sort of thing. And I have to spend very many hours trying to calm down. <laughs> anyway, so chromatic injections, they are different from players. They are also a sudden need of magnetic energy <coughs> stored in the same way, stretching and twisting the magnetic field. But the primary object, uh, emission from them is jet, hot material. Um, I see the you see one coming in the space TV and the one going up there. Um, <clears throat> so this is not thermal energy, excuse me, it's kinetic energy. And the time scale on this is hours. This is very much speed up in the time scale and the volume. So from that point of view, these are different phenomena for so players. It's just the energy from the magnetic field is being expanded in a different way and on a different time scale. So what do you worry about in the first of all the thing you worry about is the shock wave here, because the shock wave going through in time space accelerates particles ahead of it. Even called FEP, not somebody else's problem, but solar <laughs> but solar energetic particles. And they can get to very high energy as well and be very dangerous. Um, also, embedded in the material behind the shock wave are magnetic fields. Now, if those magnetic fields, I can't show you from the start, but they're the same direction as the Earth's magnetic field, they um, just sit by, it's like trying to get two magnets together with, with the same polarity. They, they just push each other away from each other. So the, so the chrome mass ejection with the same polarity, the magnetic polarity of the Earth, will have very little effect on the Earth. However, if they enter a volume, uh, <coughs> anti volume, they will reconnect, strip some of the magnetic field away from the magnetic field section away from it and let some of these particles in and that, that causes uh, a, a much more severe geomagnetic storm. But let's take a look at a rather fanciful uh, animation of this. There's a nice big flare and out pops the material in the chrome mass ejection. You can see it here the material coming. Now out ahead of it, you see this little like swarm out ahead of the, that's the uh, shock wave, you see this swarm of particles those are the um, um, particles accelerated by the shock wave. Now when that hits the Earth, that there's our magnetic field shift in blue, um, some of those particles leak into the uh, uh, atmosphere and cause um, uh, aurora. Now, here's Mars, here's the patchy magnetic field, and when it gets hit, it gets really hit. Because it doesn't have a, it doesn't have a, um, a atmosphere and magnetic field is just this patchy little Place. So unless we build our space under one of those zones, and they're not very strong in the magnetic zones, we're going to have to dig down pretty deep to protect our astronauts from, uh, from those, those particles. Now, are those magnetic fields on Mars uh, essentially uh, stable, or do they move around? I think they're stable. Oh. I, I'm not a Mars scientist, but I think it's <coughs> no, very back the way they showed them. Uh, so I think they're probably small magnetic um, intrusions that we can serve as Mars rather than you know, the massive core that we have in the circulation. Anyway, so here we have the Earth's magnetic sphere again. And what's going to happen here is this set of particles is going to come in. It's going to have magnetic fields that are actually aligned with it. It's going to strip some of these uh, magnetic fields away. They will accelerate particles that stream along the magnetic field and uh, impact the atmosphere of the Earth. So let's Let's get that 
pushes it randomly back here, then that's the pressure with the negative pinches, and those particles stream down into the, the aurora. Now, that means that it's not particles in the common it's not particles in the CME, the bone mass section that's causing the aurora, but particles are trapped in the earth by the field already. Maybe those particles originate from the sun, maybe past the but they're not the actual particles themselves. Some people get that. So, Aurora, um, let me see. Can you not click on that Aurora thing? And no, 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 the blue word Aurora. Okay, back. Um, okay. Can you make that bigger? Just grab the bottom left, right hand corner. No, 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 okay. So, here we have the space station looking down on Aurora. Rather an impressive sequence, I think. However, the thing to think about here is you've got astronauts looking down on the aurora and those particles coming down from above and hitting below them. So where are they going? They're going through the gas It's not really very much a place to be when there's a major geomancy storm going on because the space station is up to the high information order. I don't know what to do now. <laughs> okay. You know how to run my computer a lot better than I do. All right. The thing about a CME though is it's not like a flare. Flare uh, is omnidirectional, so if you if the flare is on the near side of the sun, every everything sees it. And the activity uh, has a certain width and height to it. And the Earth is a long way away and very small. So there's a chance that it's not going to hit. Now, the typical, actually large CME are about 40 degrees across. So you have a 360 degree longitudinal range, 40 degrees means you've got a 1 in 9 chance that the CME is going to attack the Earth in some way. Uh, but actually, if you get a real heavy impact, you have to be right in the middle of the thing, that's much, much smaller. In fact, here's a, a, a diagram of the CME moving out in the on Mars in orbit. Imagine one of these circles is in orbit, it is actually. Imagine this. See how little, what small part of that orbit is, is actually cut by the CME at any given time. It's very, very small. So our chances of being hit by, by the uh, CME is uh, relatively small. <coughs> However, it's not just in longitude, although in latitude, if the attitude of the CME is too high or too low, they will pass above or below the Earth and miss us. So, um, it, it takes quite a, quite a good coincidence to get us to have a major geomagnetic storm. It happens, but it's not as common as people think. Um, and then again, you go to one in two chance that the magnetic field is easily dusted and it's a strong thing and we're in the right place. If the fields aren't aligned properly, it will just go past and not the amount of it. So, uh, uh, it's a challenging business. That makes it very difficult to forecast. What's the comfort? Well, the first one is, of course, Aurora. That's the bit we all see. Uh, I've only ever seen one, I've seen an Aurora one, and that was from an airliner flying from Los Angeles to London. Uh, but uh, that was spectacular. But that's the only time I've ever seen one. Uh, uh, anyway, um, the magnetic sphere is full of currents. Again, I don't know whether you can see These red lines here are currents. You have the uh, uh, magnetic force currents, you have the ring currents, you have the field line currents, you have the, uh, um, the, 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 the currents, uh, you have the tail currents, and this is the um, meter sheet currents. All of those currents are enhanced at the time of uh, geomagnetic storm. Also, it disturbs the ionosphere. The extra radiation of, of, of the ionized ionosphere, more particles be ejected into the ionosphere, and the ionosphere becomes disturbed, and uh, that affects a lot of things like communication. And then, of course, we have high energy particles that, that amp up the uh, um, uh, Van Allen radiation belt, and any satellite going through that can have problems. So, there's lots of possibilities, and the bigger the event, the bigger those problems are. Chrono holds the third thing, and you think that the hole is not going to be really much of a problem. Uh, but it is. What a chrono hole is, is a large area of a weak magnetic field, all the same clarity. So, unlike sunspot regions where the field line uh, connects back to the sun, because you have two strong opposite of polarity, the opposite polarity region, um, chrono holes are all the same clarity. So, the only place they can go is the field line can go straight back. 
relating so they connect with the expanding magnetic field. So particles that can't cross magnetic fields, charged particles that can't cross magnetic fields are easily. The only direction they can go is out. And that creates the solar wind. So let's see. We have two types of solar wind. We have low speed solar wind, which goes 300 to 600 kilometers a second, and has a temperature around a million degrees. It's probably in the origin of very high up in the solar atmosphere. Now, for me, 300 to 600, uh, 300 to 600 uh, kilometers a second is pretty fast. But the high speed solar wind goes nearly twice as fast. It's a bit lower temperature, so it's probably more of a simulation to just slow it down. You can see the contrast between the two sorts of regions when you take the taken from the community space of watching down the bunker. So this is the total minimum. You can see that the highest is the deep circles here are the speed, but this is uh, 300 kilometers per second, and this is 750 kilometers per second. So at these high latitudes, you can see it's all primarily high speed over the wind. But at a very narrow band at the minimum uh, near the equator, you have some a little bit of low speed over the wind. The solar maximum is just mayhem. It's all mixed up high and low speed um, all over the place. So this is a um, this is a much more complicated structure again to uh, to try and uh, um, to talk about. So you know, which of those spikes can be hitting the Earth at what time? Uh, you don't know. But this outflow of uh, of uh, particles is, is quite substantial. Something between one and two million tons of uh, material every second in the solar wind. So, what are the space weather effects? Well, well first problem is actual space, we can touch on that a little bit. Second is space satellite, the effect on, on lower surface of satellites in particular. On the surface of the Earth, there's problems with navigation, communication, energy, and various other things. These are only just a few of the things that I can bore you for several hours of all and I'm probably would. Um, <laughs> So let's, let's see what coral humans get when they interact with space weather. Well, radiation sickness is a big problem. Gamma ray flares, as we said before, very penetrating ionizing radiation can destroy cell tissue very easily. So you don't want to be out when the may get in your, uh, in your space suit when there's a major gamma ray flare. You want to be deep in a nice uh, detected particle of the spacecraft. Um, so range of particles from coronal mass ejection, the geomagnetic storm, the proton flares, again, we touched on this. Very ionizing, very penetrating type of, uh, of uh, particles and can do great damage. Now, one of the things that's rather kind of nasty about those is that you can shield with some metal, like, say, aluminium, sorry, aluminium. No, no, I suppose. The problem there is that yes, the metal will actually stop them, but they then produce a secondary shower of uh, low energy particles. Which many of just as bad. So um, you need to shave with a particular substance. And does anybody know what that substance is? Lead. No, that's, that's bad. Oh. Ooh, yeah. Water. Ooh. We're made of water. That's why these things impact us so that much because it's really good at absorbing it. So what you need to do, the good news is that we can shield our astronauts going to Mars or on Mars if we surround them with water. The bad news is we need about 15 meters of it, uh, which is rather heavy. Uh, and we have to have all around because these things are, 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 are on the direction. And the same thing applies to black cosmic rays that come from supernova. In fact, they are the biggest threat for going to Mars. Not, not the solar particles, because you just choose the time that sort of minimum to do that. Really. The black cosmic rays are the major problem. Danger area, low Earth orbit, gamma rays will affect you, normal rest are protected by the magnetosphere. High altitude, now, a, a high altitude orbit like we saw from the space station, solar energy particles and geomagnetic storms are a problem as well. But outside the Earth magnetosphere, all of them are a problem. Uh, and as I say, don't, don't have your face on the moon or going to the moon, have your face on Mars or going to Mars, is going to be a problem. We need to be able to solve space weather. Uh, we have to be here and here, here our way around space weather to do anything. Satellites. Now this red picture here are all satellites in the Earth orbit. Mm -hmm. uh, they're currently in the Earth orbit. These line around the, the sun here, around, around the Earth here, they are the uh, geo uh, stationary mm -hmm. satellites. Uh, and these ones here are the uh, um, geosynchronous satellites. 
so you have a huge number. The high altitude ones like the geostation and geosynchronous aren't affected by this. It's a low, uh, low uh, altitude that's affected by, by, by uh, uh, orbital stabilization. So what happens? Here's, here's the uh, limb of the Earth, and you see a nice thin blue atmosphere here. The sun produces a flare that heats that, the other parts of that atmosphere, and it expands. So now your satellite is now not orbiting in a very low density medium, but a somewhat higher density medium. And the density of the medium determines the lifetime of the satellite. Again, you probably can't read the numbers here, so I can make them up and you'll be able to start ticking. Um, if, you're, if you're at a lot of orbit of about 400 miles, you have a, a life, expected lifetime of about 10 years on, under average solar conditions. However, if you um, heat the atmosphere, that curve moves to the right. So if you're at 400 kilometers uh, now, it's more like one year. Now, it does, of course, the heating doesn't occur for a year, it occurs for a few days, or in some cases, just a few hours. So it wouldn't just it would degrade the orbit. Um, and so you'd be going along happily at 400, uh, your satellite would be going along happily at 400 uh, uh, miles up. A flare will heat the atmosphere for a couple of days, and the, it, the orbit will drop by four, three or four kilometers. The next, the next, uh, so now it's orbiting in a slightly lower altitude, and its lifetime is shortened. So the next flare will drop in another three or four kilometers. Five kilometers. So this goes on and on for each and every flare. We had a terrible situation. I was an investigator on an instrument called the XRP, the X-ray polygonator. Where did you get the information? Um, uh, on the solar maximum mission back in the 80s. And toward the end of the mission, the, the four of world was getting a bit low. And we were, we've gone through all the way through solar minimum and we've seen hardly any flare. And now we're beginning to get flare. But we had a terrible situation where the more flares we saw, the shorter the lifetime of our mission, so the less flares we saw. And if there weren't any flares, the mission stayed up longer, but we didn't see any flares. So it was, it was, it was really uh, heartbreaking. Oh, we have a flare! Oh, okay, the orbit's dropped. Mm -hmm. So but that's it, what the impact is in the dollar. If you are you're operating lower forward satellites for commercial reasons, uh, the, the higher the solar activity, the more often you have to replace those satellites, it costs you a lot of money. So um, people are very keen on us being able to um, forecast the solar cycle, and I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, so what else? Well, there's an index degradation. We saw that goes on effect on our, our images. So you could be taking images of the Earth, and your images are ruined by the proton, or, what, or whatever else you want to be picture of. Think of it upset and what you get back up. Chrome section, uh, cosmic ray and uh, geomagnetic storm, uh, they use the satellite in high energy particles. Some of the particles are given that some component, uh, and they change, they give the command bit from a zero to a one or from one to zero, and give your spacecraft or your instrument a completely wrong command. What usually happens then is the, the design problem is the thing will go into what's called the state hole, and then you have to start it all up again from scratch. Uh, Make sure that, it's, uh, uh, that uh, it's nothing is damaged. A latch up is much worse because that is where the, the part is actually zap an electronic component and kill your instrument or kill the spacecraft. Um, as a friend of mine uh, put it, an uh, electronic engineer, a friend of mine put it, um, electronics don't work when you, put the, when you let the smoke out. <laughs> Another thing which is rather annoying is that the ultraviolet light degrades the uh, solar array. So you have a problem that uh, as your lifetime of your um, solar array, your satellite goes along, your solar array gets less and less efficient. So you have to size the array to the light of emission and the solar emission. So again, it's very important to understand what the solar cycle is doing to be able to size the solar emission. Otherwise, you have to make huge arrays which are very expensive. And then it's also a bit like discharge. Solar wind uh, being a extremely hard to build up charge surface of the spacecraft. Eventually the charges become so large that they break down and uh, have the little bolts of lightning going here, there, and everywhere. And in fact, one of those bolts of lightning gets on the other side. So, again, uh, yeah, we have a very electronic. So, yeah, it's very important how you ground will be very efficient and how, how close things are to getting, how you pop them so that you don't get this sort of effect. Okay, now that 
foundation. Well, we first had to have the GMA that still wasn't going to start going crazy. Um, and so um, we have records actually of uh, compass needle deflection going back uh, many, many decades. But we don't worry about compass anymore. We have GPS. Mm -hmm. uh, only problem is that that's just dissolvable. I only expect the scintillation caused by, uh, remember I told you the ion could come to grade, uh, and introduce errors of up to 20 meters in the location of a, 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 on the surface of the Earth. Now, if, does anybody have a GPS that is a deep breadcrumbs when uh, you on a road that is booked there on their map? We, we, we do. My wife does on, on her car. And some of our often travel roads, we have this sort of um, very broad fairway of, um, of breadcrumbs either side of it because the GPS there is during um, uh, some storm. Now, the biggest error is in altitude. It can be up to 100 meters of um, the major storm going on. Um, and then you think, well, we don't really use the, the altitude very much in terms of, um, of uh, uh, our, our, our using the GPS on our car or whatever. But the next generation of air traffic control and um, onboard controls of airplanes is going to be using GPS. Now, and some thought is to use this to actually help land the, the uh, aircraft. So, if your GPS is by 100 meters and it tells the airplane to land it, it's still 100 meters up, that <laughs> doesn't really sound very good, does it? Similarly, if it uh, uh, tells that you just landed, it's still tells you've got 100 meters to go, you're going to keep the engines on far too long and run off the end of the runway. So this is not good. There are ways around it, but it's very expensive. And the worst thing of all is no service. You can get wavelengths that are actually saturated by solar emissions that during the flares. Yeah. Here's the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, and <coughs> the wavelengths that use many of our common devices can be saturated by a large solar flare. There was a case um, some years ago where uh, for three hours GPS didn't work uh, because of uh, a solar flare. That was an exceptional thing. It's usually just a few minutes, but if your GPS is giving you a problem, you can now have an excuse that it's the sun, whether it is or not. Okay, commercial air flights. Now, who would have thought that what happened when the sun would affect commercial air flights? Well, there's a radiation hazard. Transporter flight crews are considered to be radiation workers in Europe. They have to carry radiation bags. And they, there's limits to any exposure that they're allowed. Uh, so the airlines have to have more flight crew uh, to spread the, uh, the radiation exposure amongst folks. If you fly on an airline at 40,000 feet, an airline at 40,000 feet, during a major geomagnetic storm, beneath a, a, um, uh, uh, an aurora, you're getting the radiation exposure of a chest. Uh, of course, your crew, you're doing that several times a week, and that's generally probably not good. Uh, one of the ways of running this is to fly at lower altitudes, but that uses more fuel and cuts on than on the airline clock. Also, airlines require planes to be in continuous contact. And when you're going over the uh, poles, like on a route from New York to Beijing, um, if there's um, a major geomagnetic storm going on, that the certain radio frequencies are out, usually the ones, and those are the ones the airline is used. So that means that the flight has to cancel or delay, and sometimes it's a stay, or they're going to be having to be rerouted. They're often rerouted to Anchorage in Alaska. That means that it takes them to fly much further, and they have to be refueled, which costs a great deal more. Plus, you have a lot of very unhappy passengers because the flight is another six hours. It's already pretty long to start. So there's economic consequences of space weather already at the big top. And the number of transporter flights is, is increasing exponentially. Energy and power, and this is one room I'm sure you're familiar with. Um, geomagnetic storms are hand current in the ionosphere. Those that produce current on the ground, particularly in long conductors like power transmission lines. And they put spikes on the power, power transmission line, and if you uh, uh, you can trip out certain um, breaker circuits, and if you don't do that right, you can get what happens over here. That's a transformer that's melted. 
is worth like four million dollars. It was back when this happened in the Quebec. Um, blackout, uh, blackout, literally millions of people, and so many people died as a result of the blackout. And that's because they didn't lower, they didn't brown out the power enough to allow for the um, spikes that were coming down the, the transmission line. Same problem for oil pipeline. One danger there is it blows out the pump. But that's a minimal danger. The actual real problem is that the, the currents flowing along the uh, pipeline actually increase the corrosion of the interior of the pipe. So it makes them leak more and, and have to be replaced more often. Again, a great cost. Same thing for ocean cables. Sub ocean cables. Communication. Uh, obviously, radio signal propagation has changed. Radio users uh, like active solar conditions but no flares because you can then talk to people in China or or whatever, there are any problems that you can better stick in the long run on the um, But if it gets too bad, you get interference, and uh, you, uh, or again, you can get some of your wavelengths saturated, so you get denial of service. It's also a problem for national defense. Is the interference that you're getting on your, uh, on your communications channel something natural or something the enemy is doing? You need to know. And this is also true of satellites. Sometimes satellites will break. Now, is that somebody shining a, a laser weapon at, at the satellite to try to destroy it? Or is that a, a geomagnetic storm? Again, the, the uh, Air Force and the other uh, defense agencies need to know this because actually damaging somebody else's satellite is an act of war. It would be rather embarrassing to go to war with a geomagnetic storm. So, forecasting space weather. Now, this is where uh, I have to admit to our, our, uh, our case. I'm, good. I'm doing this in the best order that we can. The, the one that we can do the most best at first and then getting worse and worse and worse. So the wind. We require a model of what's called the source surface map. This is the source surface map. This is the magnetic field of the whole surface of the sun. That's to project where the solar wind is going. Now, as I said, these, these dark and white areas are actively in sunspot regions. And they're closed, so they don't play a role. It's all this grey stuff around here that you have to map out to you understand where the solar wind is coming from. So you're looking for large areas like this, or like this, which is all the same polarity, that's going to be a coronal fault. Then you map how that projects uh, out into the heliosphere, and here's the sun, here's the earth, and you can see these spirals of high speed solar wind moving out from the sun from those same sorts of areas. So that's how you do it. The problem is that measuring magnetic fields on the sun is very iffy once you get above beyond about 45 degrees of sun center. So the middle uh, 90 degrees of this 360 degree mass is very accurate if you're measuring it now. The next quarter, in the week out of day, the next quarter which is a bit of that, a bit of that, is two weeks out of day, and this bit cap here, the last quarter, three weeks out of day. And it's this bit here tell you what's coming towards the Earth in the next few days. So you've got a very good um, uh, forecast for the next three days, but for the for the, the seven days beyond that, you're completely in the dark. Or it, you're having to assume that nothing has changed and that's highly unlikely. So but that that's about as good as we can do. Until we can put three of these instruments uh, around the sun equally so we can get that. Look out the space weather from a mass section. Sometimes uh, you can see that there's a chrome mass section because of the flare. Sometimes flares don't have chrome mass section. Sometimes chrome mass sections don't have any flare. They're associated with these uh, eruptions of filaments and bombs. Sometimes you get both, and those things can be a very big one. So it's very best you can do now so you can see a chrome mass section has left the sun. Then you can have one to three day, one to four days warning, but it's going to hit the earth if you can follow the trajectory. Then you need that sort of service map for that. So it's dependent on that. And also the information you can get from me about how fast it was, how dense it was, and what kind of fuel. We have no indication of real um, geo effects until it arrives. I mean, it's an hour or two before it arrives, they have some space out at the L1 point, which is about right here somewhere. Um, and, uh, Measure what kind of field is and the field is the first indication that we can model our community. It's not that, it just doesn't work. So you have to use statistical methods. You have to sort of say, oh, look at the region, you've got a large sunspot, very strong magnetic field, 
some of the movie twisting uh, where the uh, strong polarity is mixed, so there's a very good chance of a pair of C Noah, but a 30% chance of an extra or a 5% chance of an extra or whatever. Uh, so that's why it is. Otherwise, yes. um, so we're no closer to uh, being able to uh, forecast the pair than four years ago. We had ideas of like, pre-cursive didn't work. A uh, lot of other things, ideas, there's none of the discussion working. So we're, we're, we're back in the dark ages as far as forecasting pairs. And also, interestingly enough, the fact uh, the sort of science. Uh, five years ago, 82 scientists, the world's leading experts on the solar cycle, wrote papers forecasting what the size and timing of the current solar cycle 24 would be. Uh, all of them, every single one of them, was wrong. I can get wrong because I refuse to. Uh, I refused to talk about it. I chickened out, but I was quite a good hack. But, um, but 82 of 82 got it wrong. They all by now would have said we've been a solar maximum, and it would either be a huge solar maximum or a tiny solar maximum. Uh, and we still have a huge range of what people are forecasting as a So if you hear anybody saying that the next solar cycle is going to be a more than minimum, or the next three solar cycles is going to be larger than the course, they are just guessing. What they're counting on is you won't remember in 10 years' time is what they said. If they were right, they were pointing back at their, their <laughs> comments. If, you, uh, if they're wrong, they're, we said what? Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, actually, one of the leading forecasters, uh, there's a, a website that's plotted a forecast for the last two or three years showing how they've evolved and gone from everything from a, a total maximum in 2010 with a speed uh, density of 250 some sort of number to a total maximum of about 50 uh, in 2012, and now it's going back up again, uh, and taking it towards 2013 and 2014. So we don't know what to do with it there, and we certainly don't want to know what to do with it there. But that said, we don't understand the fundamental nature of how the sun works, how the space works. Work. So that's a very certain thing to say. Let's, let's finish up on that we're measuring the complex system of systems, complex chain of physical processes, all of which is different. The problem is, those physicists talk in some terms, media certain talk in different terms, and geospace physicists talk in different terms. They don't talk to each other, they don't talk to each other. So, um, the point there is that space weather is supposed to bring all these things together. The data is unstoppable, uh, give you an idea that the sun is a million times larger than the Earth. Yet there are six or seven uh, spacecraft observing the sun, um, and there are 27 spacecraft observing the Earth. And we still claim we don't have enough observations of the Earth to be able to sort that time and when we need to back to it. Uh, the sun, we also have all the space between the sun and the Earth to worry about, and the, and the sun moving the planet. So it's very, very much understandable and incomplete. There are parts of the, um, the sun we have never seen, like polar regions, we up above. The sun to look at see what the polar regions look like. And I've got all that process that understood, like I just said, don't understand the basis of the solar cycle. How you get into a how you get out of a how you predict what the next time will be. But I think the amazing thing is that 15 years ago, all of what we've done here would be um, science fiction. And, but we've actually made tremendous progress over the 15 years. I think that's very exciting. So, thank you.
the last large cycle before um, we went into that, that, that period. Um, the reason for it right now is um, and all of the um, models of the solar cycle depend on the reinforcement of the previous cycle. So there's, there's no way you have to get into a uh, solar uh, among the minimum or therefore get out of it with the current models of the um, of the um, uh, of the uh, um, of the solar cycle or dyn solar dynamo. You know. So you have a problem that uh, for that period of time there was a very few time swap. It then kind of it quite nicely. There was another minimum around about the beginning of the 19th century uh, for about 30 years, which was the so-called Dickens winters. And, and the, the thing that's been uh, uh, associated with this is when we get these very low, uh, low sunspot numbers, it's been periods of low temperatures. So there's that, that one of the arguments that the Jack Eddy made that the sun affects climate, and it certainly does, but it's but been often used in these global warming days as an excuse for explaining mm -hmm. global warming. And of course, the sun activity has to be increased into a global warming. But at the moment, the last since 1957, it's been decreased. So it doesn't actually fit the model. So, but the moment minimum, but I think the interesting thing about the moment is that a lot of other solar light stars are in those um, quite regularly. Uh, I don't like a third of the solar light stars that have been observed by uh, value units are actually in the moment minimum, not showing the solar cycle. And so we have that same transition on the solar cycle. Uh, so the other stars do it. So now I'm going to ask you a forecast, which you don't want to do. <laughs> what? You're forecasting that I won't forecast. Right. <laughs> right. As we become more and more dependent on mobile communications and these frequencies and things like that, and less and less on landlines, for example, mm -hmm. are we becoming potentially a lot? Given where we are in the cycle, are we building up to something that in ten number of years, you know? Over. And it won't be instantaneous, I right. understand it, but there will be a oh, could significant be could be instantaneous. If we had another 1859 there, oh. you would you'd have a, a major problem. Mm. Well, I actually threw my cell phone away when I retired, so I, I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> uh, however, uh, I see my wife put my cell phone, my old cell phone, in my face, so I can say I'm on my way here. So. <laughs> But I don't think I would have turned it on. Uh, but, um, yes, we are becoming more vulnerable. And uh, one of the problems, with the reason why we're becoming more vulnerable, is that many years ago, um, most of the electronic companies made what they call rad hard parts. Mm -hmm. They don't make those anymore. Yeah. Uh -huh. And so we're using commercial off the shelf parts. And we're designing them with, um, you know, multiple components so you can just swap between the components. And again, that same thing here, a friend of mine actually argued that that increases the vulnerability because all those switching circuits make you got a factorial n more problem uh, for the tension. Uh, so I think we are storing up a problem by just not planning to it. The trick is, where is the um, uh, value added? Where, where, where is the, the point of uh, diminishing return? You can, of course, you can Build every uh, satellite like a battleship, uh, you'll never have a problem. But then you can't afford very many of those, those battleship satellites. So it, it's, a, it's a matter of, uh, again, it comes down to cost. If we could forecast better what's going to happen, then, then uh, that, this wouldn't be so much of an issue. And this is also a problem in the sense that the, the on orbit replacement is just as vulnerable. So right. the fact that you have a replacement. Maybe the impact is just as bad, so it's not really a replacement. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. The current instrumentation for, uh, for, for programming the phone and understanding what's going on, is it more lean towards RF or is it more lean towards visible UV? What kind of. What we want to do is do everything, of course. Yeah. Uh, but again, so I just don't know about that. The new exciting areas that people are getting into are 
things like what photodynamic surgery is doing, which is taking very high resolution, very fast case, showing a whole bunch of new phenomena that we haven't seen before. The other area that, that is uh, very promising for sorting out some of these problems with dynamo is something called media seismology, which I'm sure several of you are aware of, where you look at the vibration state of the sun. Uh, the sun generally expands on all sorts of uh, frequencies. Uh, but only some of them resonate, and it's like a, a sonogram, or more accurately, um, a uh, seismograph on the Earth, where these waves penetrate deep into the sun, and they're refracted and reflected, and by, by determining how they're refracted and reflected, you can actually get an image of the interior of the sun, that I showed one um, uh, in early in my sequence here. So, um, that has the possibility, with, particularly with the solar and observatory, the high gain density of the of probing deeper and deeper into the sun and also in more detail near the surface. So we can actually see, for example, sunspots emerging before they emerge. Uh, so you know, if you've got a big existing region and you see something coming up underneath it, you think, ooh, that's going to be interesting in a couple of weeks' time. So we have the ability of improving those sorts of things. So th those are exciting. And the real issue of the settlement is the future. Um, now, uh, this is this that I have this presentation on. It's more, more this space than I had when I first started doing research. Um, and it cost a uh, hundredth of what that did. Mm -hmm. so you're getting big systems that go faster and faster, so you can do bigger models, more comprehensive models, higher resolution models. And the movement towards space weather, I integrated all these ideas into one extended model of, uh, of the, what is called sun mud. Um, is getting us away from this sort of stone piping and I'm so interested in the characteristics and the I think that is probably more uh, more uh, uh, important than anything else. The last thing I think is important that I take a little bit of pride in this, is that the data is now universally available to everybody instantly. So all of you have the data available to you the same time as I do, or the same time as some of the working scientists do. And that was started by a little instrument called TRACE. We, we at Lockheed Martin proposed TRACE, and it was my idea to have the data from that open to everybody. Now it's purely a marketing tool, I, I said that now, because if you think about it, if you're on the panel trying to decide between all these brilliant ideas that people have, you need something to differentiate. And now this one little mission comes in and says, you can have a data tip. So everybody on that panel is part of our team, effectively. Mm -hmm. And but I was sick to death as a student and as a young researcher of principal investigators saying, well this is my data, I'll use it for two or three years, and if there's anything left you may look at it. Mm -hmm. uh, and that that is just not right. The public is paying for data. You should have it available, and every other researcher should have it available. And that is now NASA's policy. And so, uh, you know, the little bit that we did to win the program, which we did, uh, actually I think it contributed a great deal more to the science that we've had, had around. So, uh, the, the, all these things are coming together at this time and making for a very exciting change in our understanding of the sun. And I think it's going to get more exciting. And, so the nice thing is that all of you can participate by just logging on to the computer, looking at this SEO website, server website, etc. Okay. Um, <coughs> well, I know I I know I'm sorry, but I'm right here. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> I noticed that in one of your diagrams that the solar wind effect is coming off like a wheel. Yes. And I was wondering, is that oh, oh, the wheel? Is that due to the rotation of the sun? Yes, well, the, the, the uh, solar wind comes straight out. Uh -huh. The sun turns on the heat it. Yeah. So the magnetic field flows in the spiral. Uh, that was first proposed by Eugene Parker in the uh, And not probably a better idea since, but probably a very good idea. I did actually use the forecast now. You can actually see a chrome mass section come off and follow that path running through the field. So chrome mass section is the Western hemisphere of the sun, right? And then the sun is much more likely to be affected because it's going to follow that, that, that mm -hmm. spiral around the last. Mm -hmm. so one of the reasons, unless it expands faster than it moves out, it's not going to happen. Okay. Mm -hmm.